I get this asked all the time, and I always give the same advice, and nobody ever listens to it. So. <laughs> the advice is step the fuck away. Meaning, when you are in a relational situation and you feel the trigger coming on, you are already ahead of the game. So that's the thing to know, right? The first thing to know is that if you can feel somewhere in the crevices of your mind that you're being triggered, you are 80% out of the pattern, right? Meaning you, you've done an enormous amount of uh, work on recognizing what's actually happening. So that's, that in itself is a very, very good sign. But if the trigger still gets you, you know, you can go, oh, shit, I'm being triggered. Rah! You know, that, that kind of, which we all have. Then the only chance you have to not perpetuate the same stuff is that you somehow manage to get away, either physically get away, or get away from the, the entirety of the pattern so it doesn't play out. So there's two ways to go. Number one is step the fuck away, right? Meaning you feel it coming on. You have a pre-agreed code of conduct, so to speak, right? So in a non-triggered moment, you go, look, I know when that thing comes on, this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to have to step away. And you're going to also maybe be triggered, you know, and you might want to continue the conversation, we can do that. So I'm going to, whatever, raise my hand, and that's the sign that I need to get the hell out of here. And that's the sign that you need to shut up so that we don't go any further with that. Right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that when you know what it is exactly, meaning, I don't know... Um, your your husband suddenly becomes your father. You know, this is just... Uh, so when you know that that's happening and you both know that that's what's going on and he reciprocally sees you as his father or something like that, right? You Whoever catches it first says the code word, right? And the code word in that case could be your father's name or his father's name. It could also be something really funny. Ideally, it's something that interrupts the pattern. It's, it's happening and suddenly you go, whatever, Humpty Dumpty yeah, or, or Mr. Potato Head, you know, or whatever. So something that where you both go, oh God, here we go again. And there's a moment where it interrupts the pattern. Then you have a chance that it might not catch you. You mean when that, this happens with your children? Yeah. You have to step away. Yeah. You have to step away. With your children, there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. They're not yet equipped to deal with, with Humpty Dumpty. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty might never be put back together again. And then, yes, with your children, you have to somehow get away. You know, With your partner, you can work things out. Your trigger is your trigger, and the trigger is mostly old stuff, and it can be traumatic or just yeah, yeah. old shit. Your emotion is your emotion, right? So meaning the, the fact that it's a trigger does not negate the emotion. And that's, that's an important piece. It's just that the emotion isn't commensurate to what's actually happening. Like commensurate is if it's on level with what's actually happening. So you get angry and your expression is exactly the way, the, the kind of anger you have versus you get angry and it's really, you know, like let's say I drop my cup and it, I make a, a puddle on the floor. That doesn't call for great anger. But of course, if you're triggered and you have all the other things backed up, you might explode over something that's very small. And so that's, that would mean anger that's not on par with what's actually happening. And so when you are sad, the sadness might be fresh or it might be old. Um, and if it's old, then it's probably a little bit more exaggerated than when it's fresh. Meaning it's not just, oh, I miss you or I'm sad that you said that. It's like 
you are always saying this, and my father has always said this, and boo-hoo-hoo, and now suddenly you are like way over the top with your emotion. But the emotion is still real, and so there's nothing wrong with having the emotion, and nobody should ever fault you for having the emotion, but where you place the emotion, that one you have to consider. You made me sad. Uh, you know, that's therapy 101, of course, right? Uh, no, right? That's not to say that he didn't make you sad, but what made you sad was what happened made you sad. And he didn't wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to call her and I'm going to make her sad, right? <laughs> so that when you are having that trigger, the emotion behind it is real. And it's very bad when somebody tries making that emotion invalid. But you can have the emotion away from the situation, and that's what you did, so that you honor your own emotions. But honoring your own emotions is not the same as honoring your own emotions on somebody. Right? That's very important. Well, I think there's best practices, right, in general, but then there's the individual uh, relationship that requires that you figure that one out. Best practice, of course, is that at some point in your relationship you have defined the things that cause issues and you have strategies around that, right? So you do know, okay, this will happen, and when it happens, we've talked about it, we know exactly what that is, so let's just move on, right? But of course, if it's stuff that hasn't been defined yet, then it needs to be talked about, no? But for the most part, after a little while in relationship, it's same old, same old, pretty much, right? And then, then at some point, you just have to go, okay, well, here we go again, uh, uh, uh. Let's just move on. Not in a suppressive way, but in a... Right. Yeah. It's not very fun, but hey, humans, part of the deal. <laughs> yeah. In the way that I look at pleasure um, as an exploration in, in a bigger picture is that there's aspects to pleasure that you can tend to on a regular basis so that your general perception of pleasure grows and develops. Right? Because pleasure, like all other things, can be practiced. And you can explore pleasure the same way that you explore body movement or dance or you know, playing the piano or something like that. So the, the thing that we just concerned ourselves with is background pleasure practice. Right? So the, this particular bit of nonlinear we did um, is an exploration into pleasure that's already there versus pleasure that's generated from the outside uh, in the form of a vibrator, a man, uh, a piece of chocolate, you know, of, of however, however you want to go at pleasure. Right? So, so we're looking at sensations that are always available to make your body feel more alive, more switched on, turned on, however you want to say that. Right? So when you describe the warm, tingly feeling on the base of the body, that's a twofold thing. One aspect is it's always available to you. And two, you can't always feel it. And the can't always feel it has two components. One is you are numb to the sensations that are there, or you, or you are so somewhere else that all the energy is somewhere else and you don't actually have a switched on area down there, so to speak, right? Both of which can happen. Nothing wrong with either of them. It's just good to know that you can access these things and put focus there. So um, when you do a practice like we did where you start feeling the subtle um, aliveness and pleasure that's there, then bringing the attention to that area, of course, energy follows attention, right? Brings more energy to that area, which makes the area more alive. So that aliveness 
then could be used because you said, what do I do with that, right? You can just let it sit there to inform you creatively or let it sit there while you work so that your body doesn't go dead while you do things with your head, right? So you don't have to necessarily um, do anything with the sensation other than keep the sensation alive as a counteraction to the to the thinking, 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 thinking. So when you were saying, well, now it, when we, we started talking, it goes away. Yes, one of the reasons is that your energy uh, follows your attention and your attention is on your thinking and your head. So some of the energy gets pulled. And then the other part is that you're no longer paying attention to that area. And that's something that you can practice. So meaning you can practice sitting here and feeling, specifically when you sit like this, you could feel where the perineum touches, let's say, the chair, the way I'm sitting right now. I could relax energetically and physically my perineum to the point that it actually touches the chair, right? And then put, keep attention there while I'm talking with you, which, of course, brings my center of gravity much lower and keeps my lower body, and you can hear it in my voice, right? If I really, really, really go there, my voice will drop because my energy goes down and my breath goes down and the lower body becomes very alive, All right? So now I can spread that through my thighs and down into my feet and I could like move my feet in a way that there's pleasure in my toes and so then my entire lower body stays alive while I'm thinking and talking. Right? And so over time, you can cultivate that as something so that your body stays alive. And then when you come home and your son is in bed and everybody's done with work and you do want to have a romantic moment of some sort, you don't have to go from feeling nothing to orgasm, which is a long freaking way. Mm -hmm. right? And it takes a lot. And that's why often we need such extreme stimuli because there is, there's just, we go from zero to, let's say, 100, right? But if you're like, let's say, at 50 or 60, and then you could go, oh, I'm at 50 or 60, now I'm going to have a bath, now I'm actually going to move a bit, I'm going to relax my lower body, maybe I'll touch my lower body. Suddenly you're at 80, 90, which of course makes it so much easier to get to 100. Oh. So that's what it's good for. Right now, in this moment, you can just cultivate or, or learn how to cultivate it while keeping the head also involved. And at the same time, I want to say that there is absolutely times where that's not necessary. Right? You don't always have to be entirely enlivened, sopping wet, you know, <laughs> like oozing, you know, out of all orif or orify, I think would be the proper, you know. You don't have to do that. Sometimes it calls for using every bit of energy you have on something that requires a lot of attention. But then you know in the aftermath when you've noticed that not, not, nobody's home from, down, from here downwards, then you'll do practices to bring that back on, online. And of course, the more... Um, precedence you have, meaning the more the the more often you have done that, the easier it is to go back there. Yes, of course you could move it. The the, the tricky thing with Kundalini energy, of course, is what the fuck you know mm -hmm. is that really right? No, there is not really a coiled serpent at the base of your body, right? I mean, there just isn't. Uh, but, of course, there is, energetically speaking, right? And because these are energetic things, what people are describing is the mm, best common ground that they, they can find. So, so the description of kundalini energy and kundalini rising is the description of people who have pooled their experience into something that becomes somewhat codified then. Right. So now we assume it goes a certain way. Well, yes, there's aspects that look and feel the same in most people, but the specifics are specific to you. 
And depending on, and then of course, depending on the school and depending on who describes it, it looks different and is different, and everybody knows exactly how it's going, right? So, and then a lot of practices are uh, essentially a superficial imposing of what people think it should feel like as a uh, replacement for what it really feels like when you let it naturally happen. Right? So could you move it? Yes, you can move it anywhere you want because energy follows attention. Right? So you could go, oh, you're pleasurably alive in the perineum. Now you're going to try and spread that. How do you spread it? Well, you spread it by starting to move your body and noticing if some of that movement or some of the attention or some of the breath moves it to where you want it to go. Right? And then when you found the thing that makes it go to the base of your um, channels, so to speak, because supposedly there's these channels right, where the kundalini moves up, um, then when you feel like that's there, then, then you start moving with that energy, seeing how far you can bring it up, so to speak. So yeah, you can do all kinds of things, and there's of course all kinds of prescribed breathing and moving and whatever that you can then do. But at the very least, you can spread pleasure anywhere you want, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so yeah. And certainly, I want to just say one more thing about that. Certainly, when you are aware of um, the way the energetics of the body work, breath and touch and movement can certainly open the channels. No. And you can feel that. You can feel when a channel opens, so to speak. And, and somebody who's very, very practiced can look at you and go, yeah, yeah, that's the channel. But mostly you just feel it for yourself. And that's good enough. Yeah. The thing is, you can't negate that your head is involved, right? Unless you can actually actively, completely calm your brain, which some people can do. Um, you have to just deal with the fact that you're also going to have thoughts and fantasies and whatever. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because, once again, energy follows attention. So if the attention comes in the form of a visualization or fantasy, the energy will still go there. So it's not like a no, no, no. Um, but of course, if the fantasy overrides, you know, the fantasy is kind of a hack, so to speak, and it overrides a deeper feeling sensation, then at one point you might not want to do that for a while and find other ways to do it. But in general, everything goes to begin with. You know. It's your practice, Right, uh, meaning, yeah, we we know certain things you shouldn't be doing, but only you will be able to tell if that's really true, and how will you know by the results? And that you will find out pretty quickly, right? If you use a fantasy to spark an arousal, and that's the only way you can get aroused, well, that, you know, then you can go, well, that's just the way I'm built and that's how I'm going to do it or you can go are there other things I could do well, and one of the ways that you would figure that out is you would eliminate that particular spark mm -hmm. and then see what happens and for the most part then you would probably find why that is right so let's just say you know, it's a stupid thing but you can only get aroused if you imagine a violent, vicious band of teddy bears. <laughs> right, so that's what arouses you. Right? So that would be very interesting. I was just trying to come up with something that's very bizarre, right? So, but somehow that works. You think of those teddy bears, you know, with their big fuzzy hard-ons, and <laughs> yes, they're like all plush, you know, plush penises. And you're writhing in ecstasy, and your body is, wi is, is wildly alive, right? Now you're going, well, I can't get aroused without that. Yeah. And some of our sexual fantasies are about as ridiculous yeah. as that, you know, not as outwardly. So now, now you are trying to get aroused without imagining a plush uh, teddy bear penis, and you can't.
when you do that, when you go, okay, well, I'm going to try and masturbate without thinking of plush teddy bear penises, then suddenly the underlying reason for that will be revealed. Because, like, say you then try and imagine a non-fuzzy penis, right? And that's not doing it. And not only is it not doing it, suddenly you're like, ew. And then you go, oh, uh, I, yeah, it turns out I don't actually like men. The reason I fantasize about teddy bears is because blah, 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 and so on and so on. Right? So you could... Uh, you, you can then see what's actually happening underneath that on one end. On the other end, you know, most people have some kind of set of fantasies that does the trick and that are deeply embedded in their nervous systems, and that's not necessarily a bad thing unless that pattern rules you versus you rule the pattern. You know, if if you can decide to use that fantasy or not, might as well when you feel like it. Yeah. But if that's the only thing that gets you off, so to speak, then that might be a bit restrictive. Yeah. And this is particularly true, mind you, when you have those kind of fantasies about one specific man. Because God forbid you have some kind of heartache or uh, you know, other issues around that particular man, now you no longer can have orgasms which happens to women all the time. Uh, yes. So, you know, these are certainly things to consider when you do pleasure practice. The channels throughout the body, energetic channels, however you want to say that, open and close, and that's completely normal, right? And certain actions like the tongue on the roof of the mouth or, you know, that's why there's all these mudras in, you know, in the different sexual yoga traditions. You can close a channel with a certain mudra mm -hmm. or you can open a channel with a certain mudra and there's things you can do with your feet and toes which is where the thing with the, the stuff coming up mm -hmm. happens right so the, the you can direct certain things but that's not where you start where you start is exactly what you're doing which is you allow things to open and as they open you'll have energy run through them and at some point it becomes more reliable meaning you can correlate certain things happening to certain things mm -hmm. and then you could eventually move it so you can start playing around with these kind of things um, if you wanted to but it's not necessary per se because at some point it becomes completely clear what's connected with what and then, then you'll have it, and then you can use it however you want it. But in the meantime, it's a matter of just enjoying and experimenting because those things are very, very individual to each human's um, energetic blueprint. Well, you said you gave yourself your own answer, essentially. And by saying this, meaning the head your capacity, your ability to go outward, project, direct, is well practiced, right? And you don't have any closures or contractions around it, um, meaning you're not going, oh my God, I shouldn't be so much, or I shouldn't be this, or I shouldn't be that. You're just doing the thing you're doing, speaking and thinking and directing and, and dealing with kind of the upper part of your body. So that is your most... Um, trained capacity, right? And, of course, the um, feeling the lower body pleasure, background pleasure, uh, orgasmic, um, you know, energy isn't as practiced because you don't do it as much. And so it's not a matter of there being something wrong at all, because there isn't. It's just a matter of if you want both to be equally strong, you have to practice both equally. And, of course, it's much, much easier to be strong up here because most of life happens up in the head, heart, expression, voice, you know, this whole area. So it's easy, you know, in, in, the, in the yoga traditions, they have the, the upper and the lower, the, the chakras, the upper and the lower triangle. The upper triangle is what you usually live with. 
Now, the lower triangle runs everything for most people, you know, food, sex, and money. But it's not, but when we look at it as pleasure and the energy that's happening down there, that's usually not as cultivated for many reasons. One of which is there's no real place for that in normal day to day life, unless you're a sex worker, let's say. <laughs> you know, but if you're not a sex worker, uh, or, 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 you know, in that realm all the time, this up here will get practiced a lot more. So you, when you say, is there practice? Yes, it's what we just did, and it's also extended self-pleasure practice. And I'm saying extended because to, in order to build the kind of capacity that you have up here, you're going to have to do quite a bit, right? And so one of the... <laughs> Yeah, you know, just set, a, set aside a few hours a day. And if you would, let's just say, I'm not saying you can do that, right? But if you would, let's say, set even probably half an hour a day. But let's just say for the sake of the argument, you would spend two hours a day on actual physical pleasure practice, either doing what we just did or physical stimulation, you'd probably have that capacity within a few weeks. You would have to do hours and hours and hours and hours to catch up quickly. Now, one of the ways that you can go at it that accelerates this process a bit is that you go beyond your natural inclination. So meaning um, you go, okay, well, I have 10, 15 minutes each day to pleasure myself, right? And 10 minutes into, let's say, you do G-spot. You have a G-spot wand, let's say, right? Because that's easier. Like, extended G-spot practice is easier than extended clitoral practice for many reasons. Um, amongst them that most people, you know, once they've had a clitoral orgasm, they're kind of done, right? So however long that takes, and then that's that. But if you do G-spot practice, you could go for a few hours without any diminishment of uh, sensation. On the contrary, you get more and more and more going. So let's just say you have a G-spot wand, you relax your body, you start, uh, you know, G-spot practice. Now you've had, you, you've pleasure yourself along to have an orgasm. And then you go, okay, well, that was nice. Let me get back to doing things, right? So if you then go, yeah, okay, so now I've reached my natural pleasure threshold, mm -hmm. I'm going to go 10 minutes beyond that. And you essentially, of course, this is a voluntary thing. You go, okay, I am going to push it beyond my natural cutoff point and see what happens. Then over a fairly short period of time, you can increase capacity quite substantially because you're putting a lot more energy there than you usually would. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be a deeper layer. Sometimes it's just longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, time, of course, is a very hot commodity. Uh, if, if time is a commodity, you have to measure it out in minutes and not hours. That's just the way it goes. In the manual labor, you find nooks and crannies that you can't find in the mind, unless you've been there before. Once you've been there before, you can, of course, access all of that with the mind. Right? But you have to have... You, you can't explore a cave you've never been in, in with the mind unless you're really good. Uh, you know, meaning some people can do that, but Usually you would do um, actual hands-on exploration and then you could definitely potentiate it. No problem there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had a time I, at some point, I don't know what the hell happened, but I somehow at some point in the middle of when I was still having a, a, a very uh, intense clinical practice, meaning I would see eight, nine people a day, I somehow, in my practice, in my sexual practice, came upon a way of breathing that if I would do, the entire front surface of my body would totally light up and I'd have like instant arousal and fairly instant orgasm, like energetic, you know, like full body up. And so 
I'd like just endlessly entertain myself with running energy up and down my body. Uh, and it was very instructional. I would track that particular pattern up and down my body purely through visualization till it was so clear what was what and what belonged to what and, and all of that. And I, I did that for months. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there's two approaches to tantric sexual practice, let's say, right? The common approach is to make people stand, breathe, move a certain way that then produces a certain result, right? And in, into that follows also the whole Shakti part, right? The, the Kundalini being uh, awakened and stuff like that, right? So then you see this often but with the man that's done very brutally. Stand this way, breathe this way, breathe it up here, hold the tongue like this, blah, 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 blah. That works, right? It does work. But it, for most people who don't have that happen naturally, fucks up their nervous system. And so the glitch that you're describing is essentially scar tissue, right? It's the scar tissue of having run energy through a system that wasn't smooth enough. And often you see this, particularly there's a few schools of uh, experience where you see people and they stand across from each other in the, in the, in the circle and suddenly... They do this thing, right? And then they think that's the kundalini rising. But really what it is, is their circuitry is fried. And when you have those glitches in your circuitry, there's two ways to go. One is to avoid that particular pattern altogether so it can heal and, and scar over to the best of its ability, right? And not get freshly aggravated. That's one way. Which would mean that whatever it is that's the glitch, you tend to in a different way. You do it differently. The other way would be to produce the actual result in a different way and have the actual result straighten the pattern out from the inside out. What would that thing look like if it would happen spontaneously in my body? Or how do I get that to spontaneously happen in my body? And then when it spontaneously happens in the body, that, that actual energy then straightens out the nervous system according to the, to the needs of the nervous system. And then that alignment will either take a different path than the scarred area or it will smooth out that scarred area because of course you can break psychic scar tissue up so to speak yeah. when that happens try and relax your body mm -hmm. right, so it's just like yeah. and that usually means then the energy can go somewhere else instead of contracting around that piece okay. right yeah, so the, the, the feeling is, oh, yeah, no. right. And, and then just work with really, 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 really smoothing the body. And, you know, I've taught men's groups for many, many years, and you can do all of these things as well for men as you can for women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because there's so much really bizarre shit out there for men... Yeah and really dogmatic crap of guys who've heard things or have taken things from people who've taken things from people who've taken things from people, a lot of guys have to undo a lot of really, really bad tension um, that they've trained themselves into. And so working with, with men's nervous system, I find super, super important because yeah. their nervous systems are often very shot. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, the, what's required of men out there in the world, um, this is true for women too, right? But what's required out there in the world really taxes the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So the, the more unraveling and relaxing and straightening of the nervous system you can do with men, the better they can empower themselves to actually do the things you want to do. Yeah. Not really, no. No, not really. Yeah. No, it depends. 
it depends on the set of circumstances and on the facilitator and all of that. But I find mostly in the work that I've done with men, except for the dogmatically possessed, men tend to have very strong emotional and bodily intelligence, contrary to common belief. Mm. Right? The whole men are, you know, unfeeling idiots isn't true at all. Mm. Men are finely feeling for the most part. And most men have developed considerable uh, emotional intelligence in their lifetime, the men who are alive today, because that's the only way that they could live in the way life happens now. It's just a matter of allowing that to happen instead of bashing them with more and more you know, of the accountability thing and all of those things that keep men little boys. Most men's groups are built around AA accountability models. AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, mm-hmm. right? where you have to be accountable to another man. But that's a sin. When you're a therapist, like I was you know, for many, many years, you go a little bit like, what the fuck? How can you empower somebody by disempowering them? Mm-hmm. Right? So instead of them actually becoming their own men, they now are accountable to other men who take the position of their fathers with whom they had a bad relationship for the most part. And and so once you eliminate that, then men can actually make really good decisions. And men, not all men, because there's assholes out there, but many men are really noble creatures. Really. You know, they want nothing more than to contribute positively. Mm -hmm. And they definitely want to contribute positively to their women and children Mm -hmm. and help and do things. And if you take all the, 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 those layers away of them having to be a certain way, their bodies usually click into place really, really quickly, often quicker than women's bodies. As women learn through resonance and, um, when there's a whole group of women who are, who are very locked up in their bodies, the resonance with other women's locked up bodies makes it harder. Mm-hmm. If you have a few women in a group who are not locked up, then everybody unravels quicker. And of course, it also depends on how, who teaches the group and stuff like that. But men don't typically learn through resonance in that way. So when given the chance, they'll... they'll Relax very quickly. The best way I can describe it, not having a man's body, right? I mean, is that um, the absence of imposition does it. So when you don't tell a guy how he needs to do, be or feel or look or stand, that freedom makes it happen automatically. Because man's greatest value for the most part is freedom. Not love, as it is in women, right? And that freedom, that sovereignty, when you give a man, not by lip service, but by actual setting up the circumstances where he's free to do how he pleases, Mm -hmm. the body just does it, right? So, So less telling them what to do makes it happen. I think it's super important, yeah. right? But then you see all these guys, you know, these men's group leaders there on YouTube, you know, the 10 things women want from you, man, yeah. what women really want. And it's like, no, 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 let's, let's not go there. But yeah. that's, it still sells way better yeah. than saying, look, guys, mind your own business, yeah. you know. And it's a very popular thing nowadays for men to essentially appeal to women's base nature, there's no other way of saying that, right? And because it's not right for a woman to demand things from a man that they don't want to do themselves. Yeah. I just saw a video again of some guy who I once or twice saw in my workshops a long time ago. And the whole video is about he, he walks side, hand in hand with his girlfriend and then he goes to the outer side of the street and she's like all a flutter because he's taking care of her and then she screams at him and he just stands there and breathes and it's like 
Why the fuck is she screaming at him? And why is that elevated to something that it's not? It's abusive. It's abusive to scream at a man. It's as it's abusive to scream at a man as it is a, a, as to scream at a child. Now it happens, but because we're all human, but for fuck's sake, don't make it into some spiritual principle. You know, and the whole take her storm. No, no. Treat a woman like a grown human being who can also manage her emotions. Right? I, I think that's that. That's the root of of all tantric evil, <laughs> you know? like newer tantric evil. It's like you don't encourage women to be abusive to men in the, for, and, and encourage men to take it as some sign of spiritual advancement. It's degrading. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's such a meme, you know. It's in, because what you're saying is people need to be infantilized. Women are incapable of managing their emotions, and hence a guy, which is just another version of the 50s, uh, you know, the, the strong, unmoving man, and the crazy woman, you know, little woman, who, 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 you know, it's the same thing. Every human being can learn how to be responsible of their own yeah. emotions, and there's never any use in being abusive. Well, if you would get just really angry for a moment, that's fine, but that doesn't mean he has to, need, has to stay there and, and uh, breathe down into his balls while you are wailing on him. That doesn't mean that, right? He has a right to show emotions and shrink back from your screaming as much as you have a right to scream, right? And sometimes he's going to want to scream and you don't want to deal with it. But no human in their right mind would think it's okay that a woman stand there and breathe and relax while a man screams at her full blast, yeah. right? I mean, no one would, would allow that yeah. to happen. That would be considered abuse of the finest order, but it's perfectly okay and done all over the world in workshops where women are invited to scream at men and men stand there like idiots and take it. Well, supposedly they're training the nervous system to be there for her and hold space, but really then their nervous system is fucked up and they're like abuse victims and they flinch, right, and stuff like that. And, it's, it, and I've seen lots of these guys who flinch. You know, and, and they have less and less capable nervous systems. If you look at humans as humans and not as men as wo and women, it becomes pretty clear how you would conduct yourself. Then we can talk about the energetics in a woman's body versus the energetics in a man's yeah. body. But basic human decency should always come first. Yeah. Right. Meaning you can't, you can't function in the world anymore. Your system is such that you behave with the slightest stimulus as if you have severe PTSD, right? And some guys go to war for that, and some guys have crazy relationships. And when you have crazy relationships, both men and women alike, your nervous system will get fried. The principle of the Dakini is... A very specific one, and the Dakini, there is a very, very narrow uh, definition of the Dakini, or fairly narrow definition of the Dakini in the Buddhist tantric tradition. There's a slightly different definition of the Dakini in the Hindu traditions, and then there is a much bigger uh, definition that comes through the neo tantric, you know, um, kind of pop culture way. So the word Dakini in the Tibetan tradition means. Kandro, and Kandro means sky-goer, often now translated as sky-dancer. So she's the one who can fly, right, who can travel the sky. And why that is, is that this, the principle of the Dakini is considered the spaciousness. And the, the um, aspects of the Dakini are wisdom aspects, right? It's the w wisdom of clear seeing. And that translates both in the, uh, into the um, Hindu tantric and the Buddhist tantric traditions 
where the principle of the Dakini, I'll talk about the different Dakinis in a moment, is that which points a path towards liberation and which makes liberation happening. And the Dakini is often seen as the muse that allows for that clear seeing and that clear path. And one of the ways that Dakinis are described in those traditions, there's two, ki- there's two general kinds. There's the wisdom Dakinis who are enlightened, so they've, they're realized. And then there's Dakinis who are not yet realized, meaning not, not enlightened. So they still fall into the, the patterns of humans, so to speak. Um, you know, the, 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 the wheels of, of the karmic engagement. And then the wisdom Darkinis are the consorts of the five Buddhas in the Buddha family, if you go into tantric Buddhism. Um, but what all Darkinis, the unenlightened and the enlightened, have in common is that um, aspect of the muse for the sake of the greatest growth and the path towards clear vision. And so in those traditions, um, women, all women, to varying degrees, are seen, because the kinis are always um, shown as female. It's traditionally a female principle because, and this is why we're doing all the things we're doing, certainly a lot of things in my lineage are done that way, because it is considered that women have the ability to inspire and enliven and uh, enable a path for other women and for men. Right? This was seen in the, uh, in the realms of practice. But the, the principle of the Dakini is the principle of inspiring through life force in the body, inspiring through pleasure in the body, inspiring through clarity of both perception in the form of intuition and clarity of action in the form of free, spontaneous expression of all the emotions, current, not old, not triggered, but actually occurring. And that's the Dakini principle. And, of course, in different traditions, some of them are held very, very narrowly, particularly with the wisdom Dakinis. They are considered the consorts of the the five Buddhas, you often see them in yabyam, you know, in that sexual position where the woman sits on the lap of the man and there's certain hand gestures. So in the wisdom dakinis, it's very specific. They, they, they're uh, seen as expressions of a cultivation of a specific kind. And then in the, um, in the unenlightened dakini realm, you have dakinis who are bringing certain principles into the practice. And it is said that every woman, you know, carries the the essence of the Dakini and can cultivate those aspects of the Dakini for the sake of creating a clear path. Right? Mm-hmm. However, however you choose that in your own life. And so everything we've done today, uh, yesterday and the day before, can be used to cultivate that Dakini essence right? um, ongoingly. And I do hope that uh, you know, some of it will stick, having the ability to bring devotion into everyday existence.